Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're not going to talk about the Seastar S50 Smart Telescope. We're going to talk about my main astrophotography rig these days, which is the one that I use the most, which is a simple Newtonian telescope together with effectively an astrophotography camera and a tracking mount to track the stars while I'm imaging. This is a usual step up for many astrophotographers uh, when you start maybe with something like a smart telescope like the ZW Seastar or the Dwarf. Too. Then you might go towards a small telescope with a small mount. And later on, if you want to do even deeper astrophotography into deep sky objects or even things like planetary, you might go for a reflecting telescope that has a, a large aperture that captures a lot of photons, uh, like this one here. And when you do that, all of the complexity that was hidden by something like a smart telescope suddenly becomes your responsibility to take care of. And it's really cool because it gives you an insight of all of the things that uh, a smart telescope or a small astrophotography rig needs to be able to do and just things become more complex. So you have to understand them all. And it usually happens in the shape of an issue that you have trouble diagnosing which leads to a lot of frustration, uh, but then you can vanquish the issue, the frustration is gone and it's replaced by a feeling of pure and sheer accomplishment and joy. So that's one of the awesome things when you step further into the hobby building your own rigs. Anyway, today I'm here because I've had an issue with my rig. And what's been happening is that with a rig like that, unlike uh, a smart telescope that usually takes exposures of maybe 10 seconds at a time, this rig, I can take exposures of five minutes long, 10 minutes long at a time. So that means that for those five minutes or 10 minutes where the camera shutter is open and, and grabbing photons, I need to be able to track the stars perfectly. The slightest deviation will cause issues in the image that I get during those five or 10 minutes. And so to avoid that, what we do most of the time as astrophotographers, especially with smaller uh, telescopes, is we use a secondary telescope and camera. So this black part here is the telescope. This blue part is the camera that I have. And the role of that is it's attached to the main telescope. It's pointing in the same direction. And the camera will uh, basically take images of the same star area that you're trying to, uh, to take a photograph of with the main telescope. And it will tell the mount here, the tracking uh, mount, that, oh, you're, you're deviating a little bit from the star, like come back. So it's basically a, a feedback loop to your main telescope to say like, okay, you really need to keep on track and tells it how can you keep on track. And what's really cool is that you get all sorts of stats, statistics about how well your tracking has been going on. So this uh, is called an auto guiding rig. So this little telescope with the camera, it's paired with some auto guiding software and the auto guiding software tells you like how precise your auto guiding has been. My issue with this telescope is that even though my auto guiding was perfect, which means that I should have been tracking the stars excellently, perfectly, without any issues. When I looked at my five minute, 10 minute images, uh, there was star trailing. So even though I'm tracking perfectly, why are the stars trailing? And there was no wind during that night, so nothing that could perturb my imaging. And this is a phenomenon that we refer to as flexure. It's basically when your uh, guide scope and your main camera that I have here, it's the blue thing here, they somehow get out of sync from one another in a long exposure. And what's very interesting is my own issue doesn't occur with small, with shorter exposures. So if I take an exposure of one minute or so, I don't really notice any star trailing. And flexure could be that this, this metal foot here is bending a little bit, a little tiny bit, absolutely imperceptible to us poor humans, uh, but visible to the telescope when tracking for super long. This doesn't bend, this bends, we're out of sync. Uh, or we could have the reverse. Maybe my focuser here, the tube that sticks out from my telescope that allows me to get perfect focus is bending while this is not. So we have a difference between the tracking of the two. And since they rely on each tracking the same thing at the same rate, we're having issues. This can be fixed with what we call an off axis guider or OAG. And the principle of an OAG is that it brings a little prism or a little mirror right in front of the main imaging camera. And it grabs a few stars 
from that area right in front of the imaging camera and then brings it to the blue camera here. And when we do that, because we're effectively grabbing, grabbing the, the star images at the source right in front of the main imaging camera, any flexure and this differential between a separate guide scope and the main imaging telescope is much, much less likely to happen. So this thing can uh, fix symptoms that can be caused by a wide variety of issues. And that's what's really awesome with this. With this, normally, when you have an issue, you want to fix the cause and not the symptoms. Uh, but here, it allows you to fix the symptoms without having to really worry about the cause of the issue. And so that's what we're going to be using. Okay, I've now removed the main camera assembly from my telescope that was uh, sticking in here, and that's what we're going to be using to set up our uh, off-axis off -axis guider. And the off-axis guider, when you take it out of the box, it looks like this. And here you can see it a bit closer. So this is going to sit in front of the main camera. And you can see here I have this little tiny prism that's actually a mirror. And it's, re it's reflecting the light that hits the prism here. And it's reflecting it to the top here where the camera will be sitting. And the main light that goes to camera sen sensor can just go straight through. So it's going to be sitting in front of the camera and grabbing a little bit of the light from above where the camera sensor is going to be located. One of the big biggest trouble when you're setting up an OAG like that is that you want to make sure that when your main astrophotography camera, this thing here, is in perfect focus, which is what you want for imaging, then your guide camera is also in perfect focus. This effectively means that the distance from the uh, back of the prism to your camera sensor should be the same as the distance from the prism to your guide camera sensor. And because it can be so difficult to accomplish by just like sliding the camera in and then trying to move it up and down like that in terms of achieving best focus, I usually go ahead and replace the area that's on top of my uh, OAG with a fine helical focuser, which allows me to very finely adjust the focus of my imaging camera by just pivoting this ring here. This particular off-axis guider will replace this little adapter here that I have that is a thickness of 16.5 millimeters because that's another thing to take care of when you're doing astrophotography. This part here is a coma corrector slash focal reducer. It's essential for that kind of stuff. And it requires the camera sensor to be f sitting exactly 55 millimeters away from it. This is called the back focus distance. And this particular uh, OAG model gave me the exact distance that I needed to have those 55 millimeters from the camera sensor to that uh, optical element here. I am going to attach the OAG directly to the coma corrector. This is because I want to make sure that my OAG is in front of any filters that I might put on the system. Sometimes I used what I call narrowband filters, and those can restrict the amount of light very much, which makes finding stars for guiding, doing that feedback loop with the main telescope much more difficult. So it's always better to try and set your OAG in front of any filters. Uh, that way you can guide easily. So here is my OAG fitted to my uh, imaging train. And then my next step is just going to add my filter drawer to this where I can switch my filters. Because my filter drawer takes M48 threads at the front, I have uh, the OAG came with a different adapter here that has the same threads in male format. So I can simply switch to that and then screw in my filter drawer. And once I'm done with that, I can then screw in the main camera. There we go. So it looks like we're done. We have the off-axis guider, we have the main camera. Now I could just like put in the guiding camera and we are done. Not quite. There's quite a few more steps to take. I'm going to remove the coma corrector slash focal reducer right now and show you what's happening inside of the uh, of the system. You can see that my sensor is almost vertical. And so it's all the uh, off-axis guider, which I tried to keep as high up as possible is basically interfering with the sensor. So I'll have issues with my image if I do it like that. I need to rotate the camera so that the sensor, the shortest side is together with the OAG. Uh, rather than just explain it, let me show you. And I've now placed the OAG so that the, the, the camera is horizontal compared to the uh, OAG. So the sensor 
The, so the prism in the OAG here will not interfere with the main camera imaging sensor. And I always try to keep the prism as high as possible in there. Typically, with the right telescope, there's still some light reaching there. If there's no light, light reaching, we need to lower the prism a little bit more until we'll be able to find guide stars. It's always better to to do your final setup of the OAG during the day while you're pointing at a faraway building or forest or tree or whatever so that you can do all of your preparation, including the focusing of the guiding camera before you get frustrated under the stars because it's so easy to get frustrated in this hobby. It's kind of like part of the fun. Uh, we're all masochists somehow, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's better to be able to prevent that. So I've put back the coma corrector and by the way when I arrange the camera sensor so that the prism doesn't interfere with the camera sensor sometimes because of the way that this works you may not be able to rotate it enough and for that ZW the maker of that particular OAG provides some spacer rings which will allow your threads to be at a slightly different angle leaving you the ability to put the camera sensor in the right orientation that I showed earlier. So let me now insert the guide camera in there. And here we have it. This is the full setup with the main imaging camera in the right orientation, the guide camera on top of the uh, OAG. And when you're going to do the focus of the guide camera compared to the main camera, you can also switch the amount of distance that the, the there's like a stalk that the prism is linked to, and you can like move the camera up and down like that. In addition to be able to move the main camera body here up and down in the tube and doing focusing finally with a helical focuser as necessary. So I've put everything now on the main telescope so we are ready to do the final focus. I'll be doing that probably later tonight when it's less hot and humid than right now and so I'll see you then with the uh, focusing of the guide camera in relationship to the imaging camera. And here we are in the evening actually pointing the telescope at a distant uh, supermarket actually and I'm looking at both the main camera that I see here and at the same time I'm checking the guide camera which is that little uh, blue thing here and they're both in focus on that building now I had a problem, my uh, master plan of using this to focus very finely my guide camera was actually too long, I couldn't get the camera in focus while using this. So instead I had to go back to the original adapter that came with the off-axis guider, but now I have my main camera, my guide camera, and there they seem to be perfect. I have uh, the whole guide camera sensor is covered and so we see the whole building there. The main camera is in focus, everything's in focus, everything's working great. And now because I focus on the faraway building, I'm probably not well enough focus on stars yet, but because it's the full moon almost, uh, I have nothing to lose. When we have the full moon, there's a lot of light pollution. Even, even in Tokyo, it becomes worse. So it's like it's the perfect time to experiment. Plus, there's a huge amount of wind because there's a typhoon nearby. So it's not like I would be able to get some serious imaging done anyway. So what I'll do afterwards and off camera, it is going to be to just uh, focus the main telescope first and the main camera on stars. And once that's done, I can focus the guide camera on stars. And I will just be sliding the camera in and out of its adapter, just like very tiny movements until I get decent enough focus. The focus doesn't need to be absolutely perfect. Good enough is good enough. And so this is how you can set up and prepare your own off-axis guider so that you can avoid symptoms of flexure, whatever the root cause is. You don't have to care what the root cause is. It could be the telescope tube, tube like flexing. It could be the focuser flexing. It could be your guide scope flexing. It could be anything under the sun. You don't really have to care if you're using an off-axis guider that you've set up correctly. And setting up, doing the initial setup of the off-axis guider is always the biggest trouble. As we saw together, we have to make sure that the back focus distance between any focal reducer or coma corrector that you have and the main camera sensor is unaffected and is, is the right distance. For me, it's exactly what is uh, required. We also need to make sure that the uh, off-axis guider 
the mirror, the prism inside is in the correct orientation relative to your sensor. If your sensor is a rectangular sensor, like most of them, you want to make sure that the prism, the little mirror in the off-axis guiding guider is not intruding on top of the sensor due to the sensor's rotation. And at the same time, when you're actually testing the guide camera on top, if you see that the camera, uh, the guide camera is only partially illuminated, you only see part of a building, for instance, uh, then you need to actually get that prism slash mirror a bit deeper inside the off-axis guider to make sure that it catches the light from the telescope imaging circle. It's a lot of parameters, but if you do it during the day, you're not really wasting time, you're not getting super frustrated, or alternatively, you can do it during a full moon because full moons are great for experimentation. By the way, I'd like to add that I was able to buy this off-axis guider to solve my equipment problems while at the same time teaching how to set it up, thanks to my uh, channel members and my Patreon su supporters. So thank you so much for your support. It really makes all the difference and it keeps the channel going. Yes. And of course, thank you so much to everyone for viewing the videos, for subscribing to the channel, clicking that bell icon. It's super important these days. And also leaving comments to make sure the video doesn't disappear into the black hole of YouTube non-recommendations. But with that, as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.